tips for using the GoFlow uh, for the very first time is, I guess it has to do with setup, similar to what we were talking about before. You have to do in the steps that it says to do it. So you have to hook up the, can the canister to the unit before you plug in or spike your bags. Um, that's the big tip I think I have. Otherwise, it's just a continuous flow unit and it's very simple. That's the nice thing about it. So once you um, hit the start button, the flow begins, and then it just goes through a cycle until you hear the beep. Once you hear the beep, you're calibrated and you're, you're good to go. You start at 50 uh, for both uh, knees and shoulders. Um, 50 is usually roughly half the systolic blood pressure. And then if that's fine, you leave it there. If their blood pressure is 120, but 50 is doing the job, you don't need to go up. But if you can go up to, you know, half of the systolic blood pressure, if needed. But you don't, you know, the less you distend a joint, always the better. So if you can get by with lo lower flow uh, and you can still see and visualize everything that you need to, then, then by all means do so. So, yeah, so you need like um, uh, a 7 -0 um, cannula for the um, electroblade. Um, Dr. Majors likes to use a smooth cannula so he can control the cannula going in and out of the shoulder um, for the decompression. Once the decompression is done, um, sometimes we go use a threaded cannula uh, in the shoulder so this way he's not going in and out quite as much. Um, and yeah, basically that's what we use for that. If we're doing something like a capsule orophy, we don't want a smooth cannula, we want a threaded cannula uh, for something like that. And that would be back in, in the intraarticulate, in the joint, um, and fixing the labrum and tightening that up. And that would be more of a, uh, a 7 -0 cannula, threaded. Well, he uses um, an inflow, a 5 -0 inflow, um, usually super patella, right above or just lateral to the patella. Um, and then our outflow is usually our work portal. So we'll have two portals on either side of the patella tendon. Um, and the water usually flows out easily through those. It's not really a special portal that we use for outflow for ACLs. It's just one of the work portals. Um, and, and the water seems to keep up, uh, the flow seems to keep up very well. And then we have a tourniquet on, so we're not really, uh, we don't have to deal with blood, yeah. so that's nice. Yeah. But it, you do have to deal with debris because you are doing uh, notch plasty and stuff like that, and you're taking off bone in the notch, so you want to get the debris out. The shaver usually does a fine job of taking the debris out. The go flow pump does a good job of keeping the flow in, in, the, in the knee joint. Well, typically, um, to start off with the shoulder, and we have to establish our first portal, we have to get our scope in the shoulder. And most all physicians, we're gonna start from the posterior approach. That's the safest approach. There are very few neurovascular structures that you are too concerned about posteriorly. So in a sense, you can enter blindly without knowing exactly where you are. Um, a lot of physicians will take a 60C syringe of saline and try to expand the joint capsule to distend it away from the, the glenohumeral joint. Um, I found that over the years doing that, you scuff the joint just as much with the 18 gauge needle you're infiltrating with as you do with the cannula and the trocar. So I have gone to a very small, the, the four or five trocar, the small scope trocar and a blunt uh, cannula for that. Um, and once I've cut the skin, I just work through the soft tissue bluntly um, until I feel the humeral head and then I just slide towards the glenoid. At the same time, put some distraction on the joint, pulling the glen uh, humeral head out of the glenoid. And usually you pop in quite easy without uh, scuffing the surfaces. Once I've got the scope cannula in, then I can just hook my water right up to it, run the water in, it distends the joint, and then I can find my anterior placement uh, with the shoulder distended. I usually go from inside out, uh, just above the subscap tendon, and just lateral to the, the labral confluence where it passes over the subscap tendon. 
that's the safe zone, then you're just popping above the subscap, you're popping through deltoid and pec muscle, and um, that establishes your anterior portal. Um, for a lateral portal, usually you're in the subacromial space at that point, and you have the shoulder distended and just lateral to the acromium, you can push on the soft tissue while you're looking inside, and you can almost guess or pretty much see where your finger is pushing, and then you can move it to where the location you want and then make your incision there. And that's just a blunt pop through. Um, I usually use just a single cannula on my scope trocars. Uh, I don't see any use for two of the, the portals on a uh, scope. Uh, I use it mainly on shoulders for inflow. I use the shaver for outflow. If you're using inflow outflow on the cannula, a lot of times the fluid's not making it into the joint. It's just going right through. So you're, again, wasting fluid at that point. For an anterior cannula, uh, for a working portal, it depends on the procedure. If I'm doing something in the glenohumeral joint, if I'm repairing a slap lesion or doing a bank cart repair or some capsulorophy, I'll use a threaded cannula because you want that cannula to stay pretty much in place and not slide and move and so I'll use a threaded cannula. The size typically depends on what kind of instruments I'm gonna be running through it. And uh, typically it's a 8.5. Every once in a while we'll use a 10 if there's some bigger device we're trying to pass through. Typically with cuff repairs and more specific decompressions for my anterior cannula, I like a smooth cannula. The reason I do that is your work, that's a really large working portal where you're doing a decompression and you've got your shaver in and sometimes you're spinning over and you're gonna resect the AC joint. And that cannula allows you to slide it back on the shaver so that you've got just the shaver pretty much in that space and the cannula is not something you're levering off of or it's limiting your ability to go upwards. So I like a, a smooth cannula anterior so I can slide it in and out, get it off the shaver uh, or my instruments as needed. Um, and then for a lateral cannula, if you're doing a cuff repair, that's typically not one where you're doing a lot of uh, a chromioplasty or, or decompression, so I go back to some form of a fixed cannula, either threaded or, or something. On a shoulder, um, the cannulas that um, we use when I work with Dr. Majors is he usually likes a, uh, a smaller cannula when going intraarticular, the first cannula that we use. Uh, so that's about a four or five. And we use a smaller cannula just not to scuff up the articular surface. Um, it's a blunt tip, a blunt trocar inside the cannula and we're pushing it in the shoulder um, or introducing it in the shoulder. Uh, and then we have the flow on, the go flow is on that cannula, but we don't need as much flow in there. We have another outflow tubing in the front, anterior portal. Um, so we can control that, just need to, you know, we, a lot of times we're not in the joint, intraarticular, for very long. Uh, we're just looking at the articular surface, we're looking at the labrum, we're looking at the biceps, and, and the rotator cuff. So we're making sure all those structures are good. Um, once we finish the, our intraarticular work, then we need higher flow and a higher flow cannula. So we'll go to a 5.0 cannula that has more holes on the outside to increase the flow. Um, sometimes we increase the flow of the go flow pump also when we're in the subacromial space. So we're in the subacromial space, you need to sustain things. Things bleed more in the subacromial space when you're doing the decompression. So you need the higher flow cannula for that. And you don't, the space isn't as tight. So you can have a bigger cannula, a 5.0 or 5.5 cannula in the subacromial space because there is a lot more room. Well, certainly, I mean, it can happen in any case, but we do several things to prevent that and probably start off with, we do put epinephrine in the, the bags of saline that we use or ringers. Um, and that, that helps to some degree. Uh, a big help also with shoulders specifically is having the anesthesiologist keep the systolic pressure around 100 if it's a healthy patient. Um, that too allows you to keep a, a, you know, a comfortable pump pressure that can basically prevent systolic bleeding inside a joint. Um, 
it, that's a, those things are the initial things you can do you can do it for most cases. Sometimes pe people's pressures run up and they have a hard time controlling it and then you get into bleeding. Uh, one thing that probably makes the biggest difference for me is the electroblade. It allows me to coagulate as I'm shaving, as I'm taking bone, uh, and I have my cautery right next to a bleeder when it does occur, if it does occur. And so I can quickly coagulate it and I don't get big streams of blood that I gotta fight through to find where the bleeder is. Um, the pump, the uh, go flow pump also makes a huge difference because of the constant pressure and my ability to regulate the pressure in the shoulder. And and most of the time, if, if the individual has a, you know, a systolic around 100, 110, even 120, uh, if that's where their systolic is sitting, then by maintaining pressure in the joint with the GoFlow, you can keep any bleeders from really significantly bleeding. The minute you suck, if you just suck the shoulder dry, then you'll see the bleeding occur. So the pressure inside the joint is really what's keeping some of the small vessels from bleeding until they can coagulate. And when I'm working the suction on the shaver, I'll do it in a little burst of suction just to clear the field enough, but really not change the pressure in the area for any significant amount of time. The GoFlow keeps it right there where we want it. The only thing I've really seen wrong with it is if you get fluid in the system before the cartridge is placed on the unit, then you'll get an error. And the way you correct that is you just have to replace the tubing. Um, it's, you know, it, it's kind of disappointing that you have to replace the tubing, but it's quick, easy, simple fix. Um, I think they actually work fairly similar. Early in my career, wall suction was really all we had before these units. And I think these units, their biggest advantage has been just uh, issues with sterility and such. I personally don't think there's a huge difference between the two. I think an individual, if you know, when you're putting fluid into a joint, you're gonna get some leakage around the portals, and that's usually gonna be minimal. So you have to have some form of outflow, whether it's wall suction or the new unit suctions. You're connecting them to the shaver, and as long as you're using the regulator on your shaver as the regulator for your outflow, then you're in control and you can regulate the pressure and the go flow can keep up with you. The most challenging part of keeping distension is a consistent um, inflow and not over using the suction. Um, and that's part of, you know, a lot of that is on the sur surgeon's um, hands, you know, whether he's uh, using too much suction. You know, the other part of that is um, cauterizing, um, being able to control the, um, uh, the bleeding as you see it. The electric blade does a good job with that. You wanna, you know, it's a fine line between distension and over distension. So you want your, whatever you're working in, in the shoulder, you want it distended, you wanna be able to see, but then you don't wanna over distend it where you're, you know, later on you can have problems with swelling around the neck, around the chest, and those type of things. So um, that's the challenging part is to find that fine line between enough and not too much. Well, it varies. It varies in knees and shoulders, and some of the issues are the same. One, you don't want to over distend a joint. The knee is typically not a problem unless you're doing a lot of additional open procedures uh, along in the knee. But if you're strictly doing an arthroscopic procedure in the knee, the knee has a well-formed capsule, and it pretty much contains it. You don't get much subcutaneous uh, um, bleed of the fluid in, into the subcutaneous tissues. In the shoulder, however, especially when they're in the subacromial space, it's not really a true joint. It's more of a bursal connected between tissue planes, uh, the subscap and then the deltoid and surrounding muscles. So you can get a lot of extravasation of fluid. And so you've got to be very careful of not constantly pumping high volume of fluid into that space. Um, so you want a pump that you know what it's pumping and you know and you have control over in my opinion. Those that regulate inflow and outflow 
uh, one, you can use up massive amounts of saline because they just start sucking and then they pump in as quick as they suck. And you can go through water really quick. And then other pumps that if they're not not very specific on maintaining a pressure or they're so complicated that it's hard to understand what pressure you're putting it at, then you can easily over distend a shoulder and you get a lot of uh, subcutaneous extravasation and swelling. With enough soft tissue extravasation in an individual that may have some type of uh, lung issues or such, it, it could certainly turn an outpatient procedure into somebody who needs to be admitted for observation because they're having uh, low saturations or difficulty breathing or such. Typically it's not an issue, but it can be a problem. Well, um, for obvious reasons, you want to try and get as much of the fluid out as you can. The problem is most of the fluid in a shoulder is not in the joint. Most of the fluid is in the third space, is in the soft tissue, and it's hard to get that fluid out. Um, so I, I'll take my fist and push around and try and get as much of that fluid out. It'll come out eventually. Um, a lot of times the patients will go home and then they'll say, oh, my dressing's all bloody or I'm all wet, because the fluid eventually does come out. Um, but yeah, the, it's, it's usually never a problem. Yeah, if you can get as much out of that as you can, great, you know, you're not going to get it all out. Um, and then when, the, um, when it starts draining out, it mixes with blood and people think they're bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're bleeding, but it's never, in 27 years, I've never seen a bit of a problem. Yeah. So it looks like it's a lot more blood than it really is because it's mixing with the, with the sterile saline that you're pumping in the shoulder. Well, the, the suction is really regulated on the shaver. There's a little bar, and I use my thumb to just keep it off and then crack it barely open or all the way open. If it's all of a sudden just really, I'll just do a real quick, quick open and close. Um, if it's just, I want just a tiny bit of flow, I'll just barely crack it and, and hold it open. So my thumb is on the regulator of the shaver for the inflow outflow. Instead of relying on uh, cracking the shaver blade so we just get a little on and just a little trickles through. Uh, the, the reason I use a foot pedal is because I use all my fingers on the shaver for those, one to control the shaver and the other the thumb to work the inflow, which I think is far more important than having the ability to use my thumb to start a shaver or stop a shaver. So I like to use the foot pedal and that allows me to keep my hand free to regulate the flow and then I'm in control of everything the shaver uh, the shaver speed you know the shaver direction the flow the inflow the outflow